Technology is everywhere, and so should a systematic philosophical reflection on technology. The Working Group on Philosophy of Technology, WGPT, at the University of Leuven in Belgium, aims to create a platform to do precisely that. You're listening to WGP Talks, a series where we give the opportunity to our own members to talk about what fascinates them at the crossroads of technology and society. Today we talk with Lode Lauert on the necessity of technological development. So we are here today with Lode Lauert, who teaches philosophy of technology at the Institute of Philosophy at the KU Leuven, and is the author of a recent book in Dutch, Wij Robots, We Robots, and a member of our working group on philosophy of technology. Welcome, Lode. Glad to have you here. Hi, welcome, Masuliano. I'm glad I'm invited by you. Let me congratulate you on your book, which seems to be doing very well, provoking a lot of feedback and uh, response. Yeah, thank you. For today's session, let us focus on that book. In this book, We Robots, We Robots, you focus in general on three popular theories in philosophy of technology. It would be too much to deal with them all, so let's focus on one of them. And I suggest let's focus on the, the final one, on determinism, the determinism thesis, as you call it. Namely, that technology is understood by a lot of people, philosophers, engineers, whatever, in terms of that kind of determining effect that technology has. But what does that mean? What do you mean by uh, determinism in this context? Well, uh, first, a clear meaning of the determine is uh, to, to identify. Uh, it is in this sense that, for example, biologists use the term when they talk about a plant, for example. And in this case, they use it to determine to refer which species the plant belongs to. Well, the determinism thesis, however, has nothing to do with this kind of first meaning. It has to do something with the second meaning. When you use the other meaning, by to determine, you refer to a relationship between at least two things, and more specifically, a causal relationship. It means that something, for example, a process, has an effect on something else, or that something new comes into being as a result, as an effect of that process. And this kind of interpretation is used when people say that the lifestyle determines the health of a human being. And the way you live determines your health. It has an effect on your health, an effect that may or may not be positive. The, the second meaning of to determine is not the same as to cause, however. And this can be seen, for example, in the following. Saying that your interest in poetry is a result of your parents reading poetry at home is not the same as saying that your interest is determined by your parents' interest. And to determine is about a relationship of cause and effect, but that description is not sufficient. A more precise and stronger description, I think, is required. This goes as follows. Well, to determine refers to a certain type of effect that assumes determinant, namely a necessary effect, an inevitable effect. It means that a state of affairs inevitably leads to a certain effect. That effect must follow from that state of affairs that cause guarantees the effect. And that is more or less my interpretation of the term, the determinant in the determinism thesis. So it's a necessary effect by the cause and the cause would then in this case be technology but that of course still keeps the meaning of kind of technological determinism quite broad because as you suggest in your own book that there are multiple different interpretations of what or in what way technology can determine society or technology itself is determined is that the way how you understand it and which one would you distinguish well, uh, indeed, I distinguish at least four interpretations of the determinism thesis, of thinking about technology in terms of determination and necessity. And the first interpretation of determinism is, uh, is not so much about things we call technology, it's more about the technological instrumental way of looking at reality. It says that such a way of thinking has taken over all areas of a society to such an extent that today we can look at things in no other way than an instrumental way of looking at those things. Perhaps the most known example of this kind of interpretation of the determinism thesis is, is Heidegger's one. In his famous text written in the 50s, the question concerning technology, die Frage nach der Technik, he claims that the technology is some kind of a fate of our time, where fate means that it has an unchangeable, inevitable outcome. 
That's the, that's the first interpretation of the determinism thesis. That the second one concerns the link between technology and society. And not everything we do today is determined by devices or the platforms of Google and Amazon. The technology does determine interpersonal relationships and social processes. This claim can be found, for example, in the famous essay written 30 years ago, in the 90s, the last century. The essay entitled, Do Machines Make History? And there, are, there we can read the following. Well, I think we can indeed say that the technology of a society imposes certain pattern of social relations on that society. End of the quote. I'm not going to focus on this second or the first interpretation. I'm going to focus on two other kinds of interpretations, namely the third one and the fourth. The third interpretation of the determinism thesis puts forward the following. All technology has been created necessarily. That the technology is invented is inevitable. And this kind of interpretation can be found just like the first one in the book titled What Technology Wants, written by Kevin Kelly, the former editor-in-chief of the, the technology magazine Wired. All technology had to be invented. Given the circumstances, it was inevitable that the technology would emerge from something that was not itself a technology. And that if, the fact that the technology comes into being is inevitably the case. Discussions between groups of people cannot change that. That's the determinist thesis about the emergence, the origin, the existence of technology. And the last and final fourth interpretation of the determinism thesis is the following. It says that technology inevitably leads to the renewal of an existing technology. It could not be otherwise than that a new kind of technology emerges from an older technology. An example of this form of determinism can be found on the cover of the book titled The New Digital Age, Age from um, 2013 by, among others, Eric Smith, um, the former CEO of, of Google. There we read the following, I'm quoting, but complaining about the inevitable increase in the size and scope of the technology sector distracts us from the real question. Many of the changes we are discussing are inevitable. They are coming, end of the quote. It's not surprising that these sentences come from the head of a tech giant. That products lead to new products anyway, that there is an unstoppable evolution of older going to new technologies. It's not only a belief that has been around for a while, it's also one of the, the main ideas of the tech industry in general. So I'm going to focus on the, the third one and the fourth interpretation of the determinism thesis. So four interpretations, and if I understood you correctly, the first and the second one are mainly about how technology determines society, let's put it that way, whereas the, the, the third and the fourth one are more about how technology itself in its history yeah. is indeed. Um, determined. Yeah, indeed. And what I learned from your book is that proponents of these two interpretations often use arguments or draw inspiration from the theory of evolution, from biological history. How do they do that precisely? Yeah, and this is it's correct. So uh, thinking about the origin, the existence and the development of, of technology often falls within an attempt to understand technology in the same way as nature. Uh, research in this domain, in this area, began in the second half of the 19th century and was indeed inspired by evolutionary theory. In his famous essay, Darwin, Among the Machines, for example, the famous writer Samuel Butler suggests that the origin and evolution of organisms and machines should be understood according to the same evolutionary principles. Just as organisms come and go, machines come and go, and that has to do with a better or worse adaptation to the environment than their competitors, according to Butler at least. And this line of thought is still being defended, for example, in Kevin Kelly's work again, What Technology Wants. Well, a naturalistic uh, view of technology goes directly against the idea that was popular among philosophers and scientists in the 18th century. Within such a framework, nature was described in more technological vocabulary, thinking of the metaphor of God as a watchmaker and the cosmos as a clock. But anyone who finds looking at technology as looking at nature very bizarre and even absurd should know that a number of technologies are made based upon the model of, of, of nature. A simple example is a barbed wire. This wire was invented in the, la in the late 19th century in Illinois, the United States, after an example of a very specific tree. 
having a very strong torts. And that is uh, an example of how technology was modeled after a specific living organic entity. Let us look at one of these candidates in more detail, namely the third one, right? About the coming into being of technology, the idea that by necessity it, it would have come into existence. And indeed, an argument in favor of that claim that you discuss is this, again, drawn from the history of biology, parallel with the theory of evolution, namely a kind of, well, you could call it convergent evolution, kind of simultaneous parallel evolution. It pops up the same technology at different sp at spots at time, independently of one another, etc. That suggests that there is a kind of necessity there. Is that correct? That, that's the idea. So the, the argument that, that technology had to arise is indeed based on the idea of convergent or simultaneous evolution. It's, it's also the only argument, I guess. So it means that something arises in different places with no connection between them. So the phenomenon of uh, simultaneous evolution occurs in organic world, for example. Antifreeze, which keeps the blood flowing even when it's very cold, was developed not only once, but twice. Once by fish at the South Pole, once by fish at the Arctic Ocean. And some other examples are navigation by reflection of sound is not only used by bats, but also by dolphins and two species of birds. Simultaneous evolution is a phenomenon that also occurs outside nature, for example, in the domain of, of science, but also in the tech world. And the blowpipe was invented uh, twice, for example, once in Asia, once in America. And it is true that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb in the United States at the end of the 19th century. But it's also true that the bulb was invented in England and Russia at the same time. An inject printer, again, also was invented twice in the same period in the labs of uh, Canon in Japan and by the technology company Hewlett Packard in, in the United States. And the last final example is the transistor was invented shortly after the Second World War both in the United States, in the Bell Labs of telephone company AT&T, and also in Paris by two uh, German uh, scientists. These are examples of simultaneous evolution, not only in, or in, in the world of organisms, but also in the world of artifacts and more precise in the world of, of technologies. Perhaps uh, the most ironic example is the theory of evolution itself, right? That uh, Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace at the same time discovered that theory seems to support the idea that it was somewhat necessary that someone would find out that theory. Um, yeah. So I see the appeal of that argument, but does it hold for the case of technological determinism? And if, for some, these findings on the history of technology are not just fun facts, for example. They are also used as an argument for determinism about the existence and the origins of technology. So the idea is that now it, that it appears that technologies arose independently of each other during the same period, so the argument goes, we now can conclude that, this, that it is inevitable that these technologies arose. There is a necessity in the development of the light bulb, of the telephone, of photography, the printer, the transistor, and other kinds of uh, technology. So, but the idea, the question is, is um, does the argument uh, justify the conclusion? There are a couple of problems. The first problem is that not everything arises in, in multiple places at the same time and independently of each other. In the world of artifacts, for example, not every design is an example of simultaneous evolution. And certainly, many technologies emerge at the same time and independently of each other. But it's not the case for all technologies. The computer, for example, and also the car, the airplane, for example, these technologies were not invented simultaneously in different places. So if it is true that simultaneous evolution shows that technology could not have come into existence other than at the same time, you cannot generalize that necessary emergence of technology, at least not on the basis of simultaneous evolution. However, does simultaneous evolution prove that something, that an existence of a technology is necessary? And I think the answer is no. The fact that similar things arise in parallel may be a coincidence. I can imagine a world in which it is a coincidence that things arise simultaneously, but independently. So if it turns out that something arose in different places without any connection between them, it does not necessarily follow that it had to have arisen. So you, you can't use simultaneous evolution as a conclusive argument for determinism. So the, the argument is not strong enough to support that all technology is indeed 
or should arise necessarily. But what about specific cases where it does indeed seem to be not a coincidence that certain technology pops up in different contexts, etc.? Doesn't that prove some kind of necessity? Statements can only be true or false. There is nothing between either the statement is true or it is false. This is different in the case of necessity and coincidence. Two are not opposed to each other in the same way that true and false are opposed to each other. This is to be understood as follows. Well, if something is necessary, it means that it is inevitable. If it is not necessary, it might as well not have been. Now, if you focus on coincidence, it turns out that everything that is a coincidence is not necessary. But when something is not accidental, it does not mean that it is necessary. Take, for example, the fact that soccer, football, and cycling are my hobbies. This is obviously not a coincidence, because I grew up in a country where both are the most popular sports. But it does not mean that it is necessary that soccer and cycling are my hobbies. It is possible that I focus on tennis, for example, because I'm good at tennis and not good at football and cycling, for example. In short, if it turns out that several technologies emerge simultaneously and independently of each other, you cannot infer that the emergence is also necessary. However, it's important to be clear about my point. I'm not claiming that the emergence, the existence of technology is not necessary. There is no social control over technology. I have not shown at all that every technology ever been designed had to be designed. My criticism here is only that the argument based on simultaneous evolution is flawed, that you cannot defend determinism on the basis of that argument. Simultaneous evolution does not prove that anything is necessary, even if it turns out that evolution is not accidental. But even if you could deduce necessity from simultaneous evolution, you could not do so for all technologies. After all, not everything that was designed at the same time and independently of each other. Okay, so regardless whether it's true or not, the argument itself is not strong enough to decide. What about then the the fourth interpretation and the other one about the way technology, the history of technology is determined, not the origin, but the transformation of one technology into the other one. The Google book that you mentioned that it's inevitable that it will continue to grow, etc. What are the arguments in favor of that claim? Well, I'll focus on the on the three best known arguments. Uh, first one is gradual evolution. The second one is that there are patterns of technology development. And then the, the last and the third argument is about Moore's law. So do, the question is, do they provide sufficient support for the, the, the fourth latest version of technological determinism? That is a question on which I'll, I'll focus right now. I think I can already reveal that I'll have to answer that question in a negative. Let's focus on the the first argument. The first argument is based on on a historical view of technology, unlike the phenomenon of simultaneous evolution, which also presupposes a more geographical view. And such a view points to lines in the history of technology, to inventions that are extensions of each other and result from each other. Take, for example, uh, ships. The first ship was similar to the kayak we, we, we know today. A piece of wood that was set in motion by sitting in it and paddling in the water with one's uh, hands. When the first sailors stood upright in the kayak and found that they remained afloat because the wind was in their clothes, it gave rise to a new variant, the ship with sail. So in the, and in the course of history, small minor uh, changes were made so that there, were, there was a kind of innovation, but without a clear radical break between the different models, between the different technologies. The fact that the line has emerged between artifacts proves, according to some people, that there is some kind of necessity in technology development, in technology evolution. Well, assuming that it's correct, it is certainly not true for all things. Not every technology lies on a continuum. The jet engine and radar, for example, are not new, slightly modified versions of existing technologies. But suppose that they were, that all technologies are part of a step-by-step um, gradual evolution. Can you then deduce that every new version of a design should have been there? Question. Well, I think it's tempting to answer in the affirmative. If you can imagine history as an uninterrupted, slightly upward trend, 
This quickly evokes the idea of necessity. Also, determinism implies that technologies are an extension of each other. If it turns out that the technology inevitably leads to new technology, it implies that a new version follows from the previous one. Or at least it would not be surprising if it did. However, I think that the reverse is not true. Technologies that evolve from each other may necessarily do, but the fact that technologies evolve from each other is not in itself sufficient to conclude that such a development must take place. For example, I can imagine a government deciding to have an AI facial recognition system developed that closely matches an already existing design. However, the fact that the technology is the result of a decision a decision that could have not been made means that the development, that the evolution is not inevitable, even if there is a clear line in the technology development. So I think there's a problem with the, the first argument, but maybe the, the second one for the latest version of determinism thesis offers more support for that thesis. Um, that argument is not very different from the phenomenon of simultaneous evolution that I already mentioned. Um, it points to patterns in, in the succession of old and new technologies, an invention follows from another invention. And this is the case, not just in one place, but in several places. Some examples, first stone splinters were discovered and then people were able to make fire. The invention of a knife follows from fire. The making of metal came after um, pottery and after metal comes electricity and global large scale communication follows the invention of electricity and so on and so on. So this evolution can be seen, this trend of evolutions can be seen in different cultures, in different places, in different countries. And according to some, it means that a chain of inventions had to take place. And the, the fact that the same evolution trend, that the same pattern came back every in every culture and every context shows that this evolution is inevitable. To my criticism, my response to this is similar to my criticism and, and response to the reasoning that, it refers to, that refers to simultaneous evolution. The observation that the same sequence occurs in, in several places does not in itself justify the claim that this chain of, of designs is necessary, inevitable. It cannot be ruled out that the same sequence is a coincidence. But even if it is not a coincidence, this does not mean that the evolution is necessary. There may be a good reason why in different places one technology comes after another without that chain being inevitable. For example, the fact that textiles everywhere arise only after sorry is invented because there can, no, there can be no textiles without sorry. Suppose, however, that the repeated occurrence of the same sequence is sufficient as an argument for necessity. Even then, you cannot conclude that every chain of inventions is inevitable. Some inventions that arise from earlier inventions do occur in different places, but this is not the case for everything that exists. However, I, I, I do want to underline, my thesis here is not that there is no necessity in technological evolution. I'm only saying here that you cannot draw the conclusion on the basis of the observation that the same sequence of technology returns in different places. The last minutes, I, I didn't prove that there is no determinism necessity in technological evolution. I'm only claiming that the arguments that people give in order to support the determinism thesis is not sufficient. You propose a certain skepticism towards the arguments, not necessarily the, the claim itself. You, yes. you mentioned that there were three arguments. What was this uh, third argument? And is that also wrong for similar reasons? Well, yeah, more or less. Um, the third and, and the final argument for the determinism version of, of technology innovation is the, is the most popular one. It's, it comes from engineer Gordon Moore, the co-founder of technology company Intel Corporation. And in, in the 60s, Moore attended once a conference where he heard a colleague telling a fascinating story about chips, composition of electronic components such as transistors that are integrated on the slides of silicon. And they are used in computers, cars, mobile phones, payment cards, and pets, among other things. And Moore's colleague wondered whether uh, economies of scale would also be beneficial in the context of electronics. He had previously observed that this was true for aircraft. The smaller they are, the better they fly. His question then was that would the, the same be true for technologies that work with chips? That, that was the, the, the question that Moore's colleague was asking. It was not his colleague himself, but more 
who tried to answer that question. He started keeping track of all kinds of data. The price of a transistor, for example, the quality of transistors per silicon slice, processing of speed of chips, and so on and so on. In 65, more precisely, April 1965, he presented his results in a now very famous uh, paper in the journal Electronics. And it showed that, that in the first year, chips consisted of four components. In the following year, eight, and by 65, the year of publication, there were more than 60. So in other words, Moore had established that, a number of, that the number of components in chips was doubling every year. And it would mean that in 78, there would be half a million components on, on one chip. And that was somewhat over-optimistic prediction. Moore, therefore, revised his prediction in 75. The number of transistors would double every two years instead of every year. And this formulation has since then become known as Moore's law. And I think that Moore's findings are or were interesting for technology optimists, appeal to the imagination. And even today, there are still things that support them, that seem to support them. To name but a few, smartphones are becoming lighter and lighter, and the images we see, we see on them are of an increasingly high quality. Still, the question arises whether a Moore's law provides support for the determinism thesis. And although it, it might be appealing, I think there are at least three problems with the argument. Uh, the first one is that you cannot capture all technological inventions in a law. Of a lot of innovations, a lot of technological developments, and perhaps even most of them are not lawful. So Anyone who believes that all innovations are necessary cannot decide this or cannot conclude this based upon the idea of a law. Second problem is that there are physical limits to make things, to make technology smaller and smaller. It may be true that for several decades, the number of transistors doubled every two years, but this increase cannot continue endlessly. There are limits to technological innovation, not because it should not be allowed for moral reasons, but because, of, because the innovations are physically impossible. And the third problem is, is more fundamental. Suppose that all technologies improve to a great extent, and suppose for a moment that there are no limits. The number of improvements that can be made is endless. Do we then have a strong argument in favor of determinism? Well, or in other words, if every technological innovation obeys a law, are, are they all necessary, inevitable? At first glance, the answer is yes. You should answer that question in the affirmative. Many laws, gravity law, for example, Boyle's law, they apply whenever and wherever. The phenomena they describe are necessary, inevitable. However, law and necessity can be distinguished from each other. Usually, laws are about events that happen in all cases. Not all laws are about an inevitable state of affairs. An example is the law of supply and demand. It states that the price of a product depends on the relationship between supply and demand. We know that if the supply is high and the demand is low, that the price will fall. And if the supply is low and the demand is high, the price will rise. But crucially, the state of affairs described by the law of supply and demand might not exist. We can imagine a world where it is agreed that the price of a good or a service is set by an algorithm, for example, and not by the behavior of the buyer and the seller. It seems undesirable, but there is nothing to indicate that it is completely impossible. So in short, the fact that the state of affairs in the world has a lawful character does not necessarily imply that that state of affairs also has a necessary, inevitable character. And I think that the same applies to Moore's law also. Assume for a moment that this law is correct. Every two years, the number of components in integrated circuits doubles, making technologies not only lighter and thinner, but also cheaper and more efficient. Does that mean that the reality to which Moore's law refers is inevitable, that it is impossible that they could not have been there? Well, no. It's not difficult to imagine a world of utopians doing everything they, they can to make better chips so that the world will be at least be technologically better. But on the other hand, I can also imagine a world ruled by a few members of the Amish people who were not very keen to on technological improvement, who believe that ever faster, more efficient, lighter and cheaper technology is undesirable and will not do us much good and would therefore try to stop or hinder technological innovation. In that case, 
there would be no more slow. Again, I do not think it is undesirable for experts to strive for more efficiency, quite the contrary. Um, but if more slow is based on the belief of a few believers that technology must be constantly refined, that this shows that what is described by Moore's law is not necessary, is not inevitable. So if you delve deeper into what that law actually means, you see that there are so many conditions, qualifications to be made that it actually cannot support a very strong thesis of a kind of necessity of technological evolution. Yeah, though it is indeed quite a popular one. You have it in synthetic biology as well, by the way. It's called the Carlson curve, meaning indeed that there's a kind of pattern of decreasing prices of how to synthesize DNA. And again, with a kind of sometimes religious belief that it's necessary that it indeed will be made available to all. But so you give good reasons to doubt a too easy endorsement of these forms of technological determinism. But should we therefore then conclude a bit the opposite, that technology is not inevitable and that it is a kind of purely social construct, a choice of society, that we can do whatever we want with technology? The three arguments that I gave, gradual evolution first, patterns of technology development, and sec- and lastly, more slow, do they support the latest version of technological determinism? I have not shown at all that determinism about the evolution of technologies is wrong. I've only shown that The thesis that technological innovation is necessary is not supported by the three arguments that I gave. A certain course of events may be described described by a law, but it does not follow that that chain of events is necessary. Nor can you draw the conclusion on the basis of the occurrence of, of a sequence of inventions in different places, and also the line you can see in the sequence of innovations. So again, my, 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 my point would be that It could be that there is some kind of determinism in um, technological innovation, but that thesis is not supported by the three arguments that I presented. That would be my final uh, point, my conclusion. So I interpret the book then as a kind of call for modesty, for not being too hasty in our argumentations about about technology, about its uh, determination, about the ways in which it would determine its own history or society, or the other two claims in your book as well, which we have not discussed, that the neutrality of technology and the fact that, or the question, is AI disruptive or not? I think we learned a lot about how to think about this determinism thesis and how to be skeptical of its main arguments. Thank you for that, Lode. It was very interesting. Thank you again for uh, Massimiliano for the invitation. I was happy to be here. Yeah, it was very interesting and I hope indeed to see you again perhaps in a future episode. We'd be happy to join you again.